Pete Williams has a dream to represent New Zealand at the Winter Paralympics in Vancouver 2010. But that goal means he has to spend a lot of time away from home following the snow. It's a demanding schedule and a lonely existence, but Pete's passion for his sport is fueled by a determination to prove that he can do it. It is all about freedom for me, uh, being able to keep up with my peers, uh, even you know, thrash them down the mountain. Uh, because there are no barriers with skiing. It's, it's on the same level as you know, able-bodied skiing. Pete Williams revels in his life as an elite skier. He travels to some of the most beautiful places in the world. But his New Zealand training ground, Lake Wanaka and the surrounding mountains, takes some beating, even if he's out there doing his cardio training in seriously sub-summer temperatures. So it's freezing out here and you don't have any gloves on, are you, are you mad? I guess I am mad, no. I, I don't feel the cold, normally I wouldn't even be wearing a, a jumper, but it's a little bit colder than it normally is down here. <laughs> even yeah. the teapot's wearing a thermal. 24-year-old so, Pete Williams uh, knows what he wants in life. He's recently turned his attention to being a full-time athlete, pursuing his dream of representing New Zealand. It is so cold down here and you know, you are by yourself. How do you maintain your motivation to keep training and going? You've got an end goal, and that end goal for me is the 2010 Winter Paralympics in Whistler, Vancouver. And, you know, just you keep on visualising that you're going to be there, and it keeps you motivated. The life of an elite skier is a lonely one. He's away from loved ones most of the year. Pete's determination to be the best means there's little time for anything but skiing and training. Pete has spina bifida. He's had almost 50 operations throughout his life and uses a wheelchair for mobility. Pete was eight when he first learnt to ski. He gave it a go on his feet but found it too difficult. Moving to the mono ski was a revelation. I know Tanya's jealous but it's really cold down here. He loved the freedom and was finally able to ski the same slopes as his family. That's huge. Yep, and heavy. <laughs> <laughs> as Pete's skiing got slicker, he caught the eye of the New Zealand Adaptive Snow Sports selectors. So you've got a lot of stuff to bring up. How do you manage, you know, bring it up all by yourself? Uh, sometimes there's a lot of really nice people around that'll give you a hand. You know, you manage. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've been skiing for basically your whole life. Really. Close to it, yeah. How do you get from novice to where you are now? A lot of support, a lot of support from my parents especially. Uh, long hard days at Tura and Whakapapa, falling and then falling again and then tumbling. <laughs> so you, you sort of progress. Uh, I started in a bike ski, and, which had two skis on the bottom gave me a bit more stability and then after that uh, they were like well, why don't you go into the monoski you know you're you're you could be a good racer in the monoski. Pete's monoski is way heavier than it looks. It seems like quite a workout just getting into it. Did it take a bit of getting used to getting into the yeah, monoski? It, or? it did because it's as you can see quite tippy and so I really have to concentrate on uh, getting down quick so that it doesn't flip, flip over and I don't land in the snow. But let me guess, you have landed in the snow? Many a time. <laughs> it has just one ski with a bucket seat attached and a shock absorber in the base to smooth out rough terrain or bumps. Outriggers, those little poles with mini skis on the end, provide balance. So I just had my first lesson. I thought these string things were brakes, controls, but no, apparently, if I pull hard enough, just do one, voila, and get the other one. And there we go. What are they called again? They're called outriggers. <laughs> outriggers, cool. <laughs> when Pete was 15, he was offered the chance to train full-time in Utah for the 2002 Winter Paralympics. See what I mean? It's quite tippy here. He decided it was best for his long-term future to complete his education. 
Then in 2006, Pete decided it was time to dedicate his life to skiing. And this is my go faster cover. <laughs> Pete can use the lifts by catching the chair underneath his bucket seat and skiing off at the end. But last year, a serious accident put him off the mountain. First day at this resort, went to get off, and my seat stuck to the, uh, to the chair seat, and I, I was not moving. I was pushing off, trying to get off, and I was yelling, stop the lift, stop the lift. And the guy must have been either asleep or stoned or hung over. He, he, was, he was definitely not paying attention. And so I went around the bull wheel and my ski dug into the, uh, where, they were down, where they downloaded people and sl uh, bent my ski in half. I went shooting forward and the back of the chair just knocked me on the, on the back of the head. I was wearing a helmet, but when I came to, I was wedged between the snow and the chair. So I was sort of lying sideways, you know, and they had to pull the chair back to, to drag me out. And I came back here and I was very hesitant to jump on another chairlift, but once the first two or three rides had gone well, I, you know, it was just like getting back on the horse. Because he's not yet at the top of the sport, Pete's found it tough attracting sponsors or government funding. The cost is enormous. He expects this season alone to eat up $90,000. Quite liking this whole apres ski thing. Part of the reason he pursues it? Even surviving childhood was an achievement. When you were born, you were given three weeks to live. Does that seem weird to you now? Not really. I think I, I'm still on a day-to-day -day life expectancy, but then looking at it, I could be hit by a bus, you know, going back to, you know, as I cross the street. So, you know, you take every day as it comes. I've had nine major surgeries and I'm starting to lose count, but you've had over 40. What was that like? Uh, most of them were done before I was eight years old, so I, you know, time heals. One, I was in plaster from the, my toes right up to my chest for uh, 16 weeks. As they put my hips back into uh, alignment, they were dislocated and they had to do one hip at a time, so that's why it took so long. Uh, eight weeks, and then they'd go in and they'd do another, the other hip, and so 16 weeks later, I have the plaster taken off. And, but just not being able to, to move and being in a hospital for that amount of time, it's tough. How do you feel after a great day of skiing? Well, being out there, it's, you know, it's all about freedom. And then after a great day of skiing, I guess I feel sore and, and, and pain right through my body. But it, it's a good kind of pain because I know I've pushed myself. So the pain's worth it? The pain's definitely worth it. We filmed that story at the Adaptive Snow Sport Festival.